So we are gonna start talking about wound care. Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Um, I don't think she'll require it. I don't know. This is she's and she may ask you to, to talk when you're talking. I don't know about that yet. All right, so the, we're going to talk about wound care today, and well, actually, for the next couple of days, we're going to talk about wound care. So we're going to do a quick skin review. We're going to talk about wound healing, go over those intentions and stuff like that we used to cover. Some topical agents, some dressing choices. We have to talk about pressure injuries and wound staging. Then we have to talk about types of wounds some burns, stuff like that, arterial venous. How many of you guys saw wounds while you were out in your clinical affiliation? Did a bunch of you? Did any of you treat any wounds? Did any of you do wound care? Eric says a little, yeah. Yeah, Eric, you were out at Pahrump, so I think you, you they, they do a lot of wound care out there. So they're, they're kind of the one-stop shop out there in Pahrump, Band-Aid. You got to take staples out, that's really cool, right? So we have a couple very good wound care specialists here in town. Um, particularly the ones that I, you know, I know Dr. Chick Telly, who was a former instructor here, who's now at UNLV as a certified wound specialist. Um, and then JD, who's a, a fairly decent friend of mine who works over at Summerlin. Um, well, I wouldn't say fairly, it was, he knows me. That's about as close of a friend as I get. Um, but he's another wound care specialist out at Summerlin. So they do a lot of wound care pretty much all over the valley, right? So we need to remember and review the skin, right? In order to, when we think about wound care, right? So we know the skin is the largest functional organ in the body. It weighs between six and eight pounds of your body weight. So think about it that way. If you're ever weighing yourself on the scale and you look down and you go, whoa, I weigh a lot. You can go, well, don't worry, six to eight pounds, that's my skin. So I can ignore that six to eight pounds, right? It receives about a third of your blood volume. And then we've got that kind of the breakdown, right? So we've got the epidermis, which is our outer skin. Then we have that basement membrane that's kind of between the epidermis and the dermis, right? And then we've got the dermis, that's sub -Q, the next layer. And then below the dermis, we have the sub-Q layer, and then we have the deeper tissues. You need to be able to understand those layers because when we grade wounds, we're going to grade them based upon those structures. So what's the job of the epidermis? The epidermis's primary job is protection, right? And actually, believe it or not, if you really look at the epidermis, its primary job is aesthetics. It's to make us look pretty. Well, why would we want to look pretty? Why do you think the skin's, the skin's main job is aesthetics? Why do you think we say that it's, well, because if we don't necessarily look pretty, right, our species, right, exactly, mates, our species doesn't move on, right? It's, it's sad but true, but the skin's main job is aesthetics. Doesn't mean that you can't fall in love with somebody that's got ugly skin. Trust me, I've got ugly skin. Puts the lotion on the skin or it gets the hose in, exactly, right? Parts of that epidermis, we have our skin, hair, and nails, right? Now our nail follicles and stuff like that, our, skin, our hair follicles are a little bit deeper into the dermis, right? But we have our skin, hair, and nails there. Does anyone know what it's called if you have an area where the, the either the nail falls off or the hair falls off, what that the term for that is? We're going to cover that in a little bit. The term is denuded. D-E-N-U-D-E. -E. Denuded is when the area maybe has an area where there's no hair growing or this, the nail falls off the, the nail bed, right? That can happen for many reasons. Um, especially when you're dealing with the older population, you deal with a lot of nails falling off and it can be kind of nasty. The dermis is function. One of the, two of the, the two main functions of the dermis are thermoregulation, denuded, D E. N-U-D-E, -E. so denude. When you're getting out of the shower, you are walking around in denude. That's my humor for the day, right? You guys missed that. So the primary job of the dermis is infection control and thermoregulation, right? The dermis is very thick. It's a lot thicker than the epidermis. So that really keeps our body nice and warm. It's also where a lot of our sensory organs are, right? So it's made up of collagen, 
and elastin. I don't know how I missed the N on collagen there, but collagen and elastin, right? This is going to come into play when you got when we start talking about wounds again. Collagen gives skin its tensile strength, right? So when I say tensile strength, what does that mean? Like right now, let me reach forward here. Right now, this cable that I have in my hand has a certain tensile strength. Tension is part of it, right? Because tense, right? So if I pull on this cable, I can pull on it at a certain point, right? It ties into elasticity, right? The tensile strength gives the ability to resist breakage, right? If you have a cheap cable, maybe like an original iPhone type cable. I don't know if you've ever seen those, the ones that come with the iPhone. They have a very, very low tensile strength. I'm sure probably some of you have replaced. Yeah, Jar's like, yep. And I hate the original iPhone. I like my anchor cables. That's what this is. This is, brand, this is an anchor brand cable. Almost all my cables that I'm looking at right now are anchor cables. Even my little uh, USB hub. Anchor Aki. Anyway. Yeah, collagen breaking down starts wrinkles, right? It also causes those nice, what are those things that women are always worried about in their skin? Not only wrinkles, but yeah, stretch marks. There we go, and age spots, exactly, right? So when stuff breaks down, the collagen breaks down at tensile strength, the skin doesn't look as good. The elastin, the elastin gives elasticity. And what's elasticity meaning again? from physics a long time ago. Elasticity is, come on, Jerry, remember? What's elasticity mean? The ability to return to its original strength. Good job, Javen, awesome, right? Recoil, exactly, right? So this cable here has both tensile strength that can pull it and it doesn't break, but at the same time, when I let it go, it kind of returns to its original kind of little bit of squished up cabling. Right, so it has a little bit of elasticity. Also in your dermis, you have your blood, your lymph vessels and your nerve endings, right? So you have all those bacinian corpuscles and all that stuff we talked about last semester, if you remember. Underneath that, we have our sub-Q tissue, right? A lot of sub-Q is either adipose and fascia, right? What is the job of fascia? Because you hear this term a lot, you may have heard myofascial release. What is fascia's job? Because you have a layer of fascia between your skin and your sub-Q, and then you have a layer of fascia between your sub-Q and your lower tissues, your deeper tissues. Some of you, any of you, do any of you hunt in here? Just curious, I can't remember if there was any, I have some hunters. Yeah, it's a lot of movement between them. You're exactly right, right? It's kind of the, I like to think of it as the saran wrap layers. Right, that allows those layers to kind of slide on one another and move between them, right? Um, if any of you are hunters and you've ever had to remove the entrails from an animal, you get to see the fascia. Um, but that fascia kind of separates things into its own little compartments as you get down through. Adipose obviously is fat. What are the two main types of fat? You remember? They have two colors. Brown, good. Not yellow, but it's close. White, yeah. Even though it's, it looks yellow when you look at it, it's brown and white. Good and bad fat, exactly, right? Your white fat is your traditional fat that we think of, right? That's the, that's the badonkadonk. That's what gives you that little bit of cushioning, right? Whereas brown fat is really useful in thermoregulation, right? So we all have a little bit of that going through our body. Some of us have a little bit more than others. Talking about myself here. And then we get down to the deeper tissue, right? And then the deeper tissue underneath the adipose and that varies by its type, right? So we have our muscle, we have our tenement, li tendons, ligaments, bones, cartilage, all that stuff is our deeper tissue. When we get wounds down to that deeper tissue, that is bad. Right? When we get those wounds down into that, that deep tissue, that can be bad. 
So the way we classify wounds typically is by the amount of tissue involved. So a superficial wound would be an epidermal wound. What would be a good example of a superficial wound that you can think of that's really annoying? Paper cut, there we go, good. Paper cuts are excellent examples of superficial wounds, right? Now you can get a paper cut all the way down to the dermis. A blister might be a good one. Yeah, a blister, right? Technically, even a pimple is really primarily epidermal. Now it does have some dermis because of the, the what do you call it, the oil glands and stuff like that too, but boils, good, right? Blisters, anything like that, typically only occurs at the epidermal layer. Now, what happens if you get a blister or a boil and it's down to the dermal layer? It's gonna be bad, right? Now, when we start getting down to the dermal layer, the ones that affect epidermis and part of the dermis are now called partial thickness, right? And then when we get down past and get through the dermis down to the sub-Q tissue or down to the deeper tissues, we call those full thickness. This is also gonna to apply to burns because we used to talk, remember, I don't know if you guys mem remember back in the day, but Pepperidge Farm remembers, back in the day when we talked about first degree, second degree, and third degree burns. Do you guys remember that at all? We don't talk about them that way anymore, right? Now we're gonna talk about the 9% rule and we're gonna talk about the wounds. So if you have a superficial burn, it's just your epidermis. If you have a partial thickness burn, it's epidermis and some dermis. If you have a full thickness wound, you're down through the dermis down to the lower tissue, right? So all of that comes into play. So that's a pretty easy way to do it, right? So if I'm, let me get my little drawer here. So let's say I have a cut and my cut looks like that. What kind of a wound do I have there? Superficial, good, right? Now I get a cut and my cut goes down into here. Now I've got a partial thickness. Not until my cut gets all the way down here do I get a full thickness wound. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good, because that's an important. I might be repeating this for a reason. One of the students said they got a lot of questions on those type of wounds. So make sure you got that part. So now we're gonna talk about wound healing when things get better, right? So when wounds heal, we have primarily three phases, right? We have our inflammation phase, our proliferation phase, and our remodeling phase. This graph is just kind of an overview, right? So we have our inflammation, which is the very beginning. We have our proliferation, which is the middle phase, and then our maturation or remodeling. These phases will overlap and they'll vary person to person, right? Sometimes you'll have somebody that gets a paper cut and it's healed in you know, two days from now. Some of you guys will get a paper cut. Like I've got one on my thumb right now and it's just not going away. It's really annoying, right? It just varies based upon the wound and the type of wound you have. So the inflama inflammatory inflammation phase starts in the first 24 hours and can last four to six days or longer. So let's say right now I step on a nail. Ow, I really nailed it and I've got a full thickness wound, right? So I've got that nail went all the way down into my sub -Q -Fu, maybe it tissue or maybe went down into my muscle, right? In the first 24 hours, I'm going into the inflammation phase. This is a normal response. When does the inflammation phase become abnormal? Yeah, about day seven or more importantly, when you can't what? And you can't get out of it, right? When you're stuck in that inflammation phase, you know, you get to day seven and it's day 20 and they're still in the inflammatory phase. We've got a problem with the system at that point, right? What are those chemical mediators of inflammation? What do they end in? You remember? The chemical mediators of the body. You remember your enes? Your enes are your chemical mediators that help with inflammation. What do you mean? What do I mean by my enes? 
histamine, right? Yeah, INEs, the cytokines, right? All those enes coming along the play, right? So whenever you see a question that's talking about a histamine or a cytokine or stuff like that, in your head, you should be thinking about what phase? Inflammation, right? Let's say you go outside right now and for whatever reason, flowers have blossomed everywhere, right? And you've got bad allergies. You're gonna kick up those enes and you're gonna go into an inflammatory phase in your nose and your nose is gonna get all blocked up, right? It's gonna get all snotty. You think it was something good, but it's snot. That's a normal human reaction. Inflammation is normal. First goal of an inflammatory phase, control bleeding, right? So what are they gonna have to form over that wound? Well, maybe pressure, good, right? We, we, let's just say it's normal. So we get, a, we get a little cut in our arm. What's gonna form over that cut? Scab, good, right? What is a scab? What would a scab be called if it was floating inside our body? Blood clot, good. Yeah, it's a clotting of blood, right? So that scab forms, it's gonna stop the bleeding. What's the other job of the scab? We'll combat infection, right? It's gonna protect infection from getting in. And then on the inside, all of those white blood cells are rushing into that area to, to heal it, right? Um, and there's also a vascular response going on, right? So initially, vasoconstriction is gonna happen. So the vessels are gonna constrict. Why is that gonna to happen to stop bleeding until that blood clot forms? And then vasodilation is gonna occur to bring in those nutrients. Why would you not wanna put heat on a new wound? Why would you not wanna put a hot pack on like a new cut? Yeah, it'll further inflame it, right? and blood flow is gonna increase. You're gonna stay in that vasodilation phase, which means you're gonna bleed more, right? And this can be hard to explain to people because some people just have an abnormal like desire to put a hot pack on themselves. I know what it is. They just wanna put hot packs on themselves. And you need to understand if you've got a new wound or you just had surgery, don't do that, right? Cold pack for that inflammation phase. At the cellular response, there's gonna be a variety of cells coming in to heal the wound, right? Our lymphocytes, our monocytes, our neutrophils, our macrophages, and our mast cells. Unfortunately, I keep looking at myself in the mirror, in the camera here, and I see a whole package of these cells on my face right now because I've got this big old nasty friggin' sub-Q pimple on my face. That thing is filled with all those cells, right? Those are, that's where we bring in the eaters of the dead. Right? They're going to come in and clean out all that wound and get it ready to heal. So 24 hours to four to six days inflammation. Right, Characteristics of the inflammatory phase. We have heat or the medical term pyrexia. We have swelling or edema, localized redness, erythema, pain, nociception, and then reduced function or hypofunction. It does feel good to them, exactly, Daryl, right? A lot of times I like to abbreviate the inflammatory phase as the helper phase. So heat, edema, localized redness, pain, and reduced function. So we're in the helper phase. That point the body is trying to calm down the injury. The next phase we're gonna step into is proliferation, right? Proliferation is where we start the healing process. Starts at about day four and may go to 21 or longer. This is where angiogenesis occurs. What's angiogenesis? What is angiogenesis? New arteries, right? New blood vessels grow, primarily arteries, right? Then granulation tissue comes in. What does granulation tissue look like? If you're looking at a wound and you're looking to see if the granulation tissue is there, what's it look like? Granulation tissue looks like ground beef. It's kind of that bread beefy tissue, right? That means the wound's healing. You know, you look down at your wound and it's black, 
you don't see any granulation tissue, you got problems. So granulation tissue is that stuff that starts filling it in. At that point, the wound is going to contract. That means it's going to close, right? And some of you, when you start going to the proliferation phase, are probably those people that might slow down this proliferation phase, because what do you do to your scab? You pick it. You're like, oh, scab. Right? That scab's there. When should that scab fall off? when it's ready to, yeah, when it's closed, let it fall off on its own, right? Don't pick at it, let it fall off on it. I know it's tempting, right? Pick on somebody else's so that your proliferation space stays normal. Some people I know, I know some of you, I'm gonna, I can guarantee some of you guys are those pimple popper pickers in this class. I know you are. Haley said, yep, probably watch that Dr. Pimple Popper show that every time it comes on television, I almost vomit. Oh. looking at my face right now, maybe I need to go visit her. So the wound starts contracting. The epithelial tissue is going to start restoring, right? The wound's going to close. That's where we have that healing by primary, healing by secondary, and healing by tertiary in intention. Do you remember that from PTA 103 with Dr. O'Neill? Healing by primary, healing by secondary, healing by tertiary intention, briefly maybe, or maybe from patho. Do you remember any of that? Somewhat. Well, the good news is, guess what? We're going to talk about it. <laughs> so these are pictures. We're going to go through each of the intentions on their own, right? So healing by primary intention is our simple and fastest method, right? This ends up with real reepithelialization only, no fill-in tissue, right? It's usually superficial or wounds with close edges. So when our wounds edges are close, they're called approximated, right? Usually with, with primary intention, it's a low risk of infection, minimal tissue loss, and minimal negative scarring. Means you, you might have a little bit of mark on your skin, but you're not likely to have one of those nasty scars from this, right? Primary intention may be closed by stitches or staples or skin glue or steri strips, but it doesn't always require it, right? Your paper cuts. You don't have to go and get stitches for a paper cut, right? It just kind of heals. A paper cut is an excellent example of a wound healing by primary intention, right? So I want you to think when you think superficial wounds, think paper cut. When you think of primary intention, also think of paper cut to help keep you an ID on that, right? What's the difference between stitches and staples? Does anyone know what the difference between stitches and staples are? The material they're made of, right? Stitches are cloth, staples are gonna be what? Is anyone still awake? Yeah, metal, good. We have this new stuff called um, new skin. I don't know if you guys have seen it. That's what the skin glue is called. Does anyone know what new skin really is? Yeah, it's super glue. It's super glue or crazy glue, whatever you want. It's funny as I used to carry that in my, you know, when I was working on computers, I used to keep a tube of super glue in my kit, right? Pretty much it's, it's sterilized crazy glue is what it is, right? But let's say you're out in the, out in the wilderness and you get a really nasty cut could you put super glue on a cut? Absolutely, I've done it myself. I had a nasty cut going through my palm and just super glued it up, let it dry, and it was good enough until I got out of the woods and kept dirt out of it. Yep. Steri strips are those little silly, um, I like to call them the, the butterflies that go across your wounds that kind of bring the wounds together. No matter what we're talking about, we're talking about stitches, staples, skin glue, or steri strips. The job of those is to bring the edges closer so they heal by primary intention. Secondary intention, this is where wounds lost a lot of tissue or extensive or the edges can't be brought together, right? The wound is gonna 
we're filling in with granulation tissue, which may not be the same as skin. It's gonna have a longer repair time, greater chance of visible scarring. This is where you often get those keloid scars. And you have an increased chance of infection, right? So if you look down at the bottom of this one over here, you can see there's a big chunk of skin missing here, right? Those edges, these two edges here are gonna be tough, excuse me, to approximate. So that means this stuff is gonna to have to fill in. So it's gonna start filling it in with granulation tissue, right? Slowly this clot is gonna be pushed up and out. But if you look over here, all this stuff that's under there is no longer real skin. It's more of that fibrous tissue, right? So that means it's not gonna have the same elasticity and it's not gonna have the same tensile strength as normal skin. So secondary intention means that the skin a lot of times is gonna fill in with, you know, a lot of your granulation tissue and fibrous scars. Tertiary intention is delayed primary intention or what we call secondary or delayed closure, right? So this is a combination of primary and secondary intentional healing. Why might we delay closing a wound? Why might we hold off on just closing it up? Let's say I've got a, yeah, infection, right? I got a big hole in my gut because I had something happen. If there's an infection in there and I close it, what have I done to that infection? Trapped it, yep. And now it's gonna spread internally, right? It's gonna go all throughout my body. Whereas we want it open so we can get that infection and goop out, right? And then once we get all that wound kind of cleaned out, now we can start thinking about closing it. That's tertiary intention or third style intention or three with the little degree sign, right? Contaminated wounds are the common area right here. And the reason we do that is to decrease infection in the wound. That's why we'll hold it. So that was during that proliferation phase. Now we move on to the maturation, maturation, I can say it, or remodeling phase. This can be from 21 days to two years or even longer, right? This is where the tissue is going to be strengthened and reorganized to fit the surrounding tissue and the scar formation occurs. Good scars, meaning, you know, your most perfect scars you can get only retain about 80% of tensile strength in elasticity of the original tissue. So I've got this nasty scar right here on my neck, right? I, mean, I can't see because of my beard. There we go. That nasty scar on my neck, right? If that scar is perfect, it only has 80% of its original strength. What happens if I was to re-injure that area? Let's say the surgeon reopened that up. Well, the next time it healed, it's only gonna have 80% of the original 80%. So I'm gonna lose even more. And does that make sense? So if you keep cutting the same area, that skin is going to slowly break down in its elasticity. Yeah, it's gonna become very thin. Um, maybe when we get back to class, take a look at the scar I have in the back of my neck because they had to open that twice. And you can see how what the scar that I have over it very much looks gossamer like it's very very it almost looks like tissue paper right it's very thin skin so it's very at high at risk for re-injury right immature scars also known as new scars are modifiable and mobile mature or old scars are not why is this important why is that important to understand so new scars can be modified and are mobile, old scars are not. Why is that important to understand? When would we want, yeah, for cross friction, right? When we wanna get those scars mobile and kinda help them get less god awful, right? We've gotta do it early. Right now with the scars that I have here and the scar that I have in the back of my neck, knowing that my surgeries were in 2012 and 2013. Is there anything we can do for those scars? Could I put cocoa butter on it and reduce the scar at this point? No, right? The scars are pretty much mature, they're healed. I just had a bird flying to my door. Um, 
sorry, that was like very random. Like, boom, oh, how's that the bird? Um, scars are healed. There's nothing I can do for them, right? Even if I put tons of scar lotion on them, it's not going to go away, right? So, you know, here's the deal. You have scars. If you don't take care of them right at the beginning, you can maybe laser them. That's about it, Kelly, right? But in reality, what are you doing with laser? You're kind of reopening the scar and trying to get it to reheal. That's really what you're doing, right? You're trying to get the skin to kind of heal over it a little bit different. But you're not, it's not really a lot of work you can do on them. You can do laser. She's exactly right, right? There are some new technologies out there. But primarily, once that scar is made, it's made, right? It's a made scar. Acute versus chronic wounds, right? Acute wound is one that looks really pretty, right? So just that's just you're looking at it and going, oh, that's a cute wound. Oh. No, acute wounds are the wounds that heal in a timely and predictable manner, right? They can be both traumatic and surgical, right? And they heal with rapidly, gen, you know, rapidly with general restoration of skin and function. An acute wound is one that you get. Paper cut is an excellent example of an acute wound. Chronic wounds are wounds that don't heal, right? Did any of you see patients with chronic wounds? For those of you that saw wounds, right? It's just not healing, right? Most of the time that you have a chronic wound, it's going to require wound care because it's just diabetes, good. It's not gonna get better, right? It's typically gonna re result in a full thickness skin loss. A lot of times that's just gonna be granulation tissue there. It does come from a pathological condition. So that means acute are just wounds that happen and they can heal, right? Could I theoretically get a diabetic ulcer that would be an acute wound? As long as it does what? As long as it heals, as long as it recovers. Right? Most of the time I'm going to say, if you get a diabetic ulcer, it's not going to heal. Right? But if you get one and for whatever reason, because I have seen some people that are in early phases of diabetes that maybe they've gotten a diabetic ulcer on their hand or something like that. As long as it heals, that would be an acute wound. But that tells us that patient also is then at likelihood to develop some chronic wounds. And we need to educate. Right? A lot of your job with wound care is going to be education. So what can help affect wound healing? All right, so I need you guys to remember this for your boards. Circular wound moisture. We're going to talk about, yeah, we're going to get, oh, wait do we get to that part, Justin. Mm -hmm. Circular wounds heal the slowest. Rectangular wounds are the next slowest. And then linear wounds are the fastest. Right, so that means your paper cut, that's why your paper cuts heal so nicely, right? It's a linear wound, it's a line. Your square or your rectangular wounds heal the second fastest, and then your circular wounds are the slowest. Why do you think I'm repeating that over and over again? Yeah, your boards love to ask you questions, right? We're going to talk about when arterial versus your diabetic ulcers and talk about which one of those heals faster, right? And it's based upon their shape. The downside is no matter what, the larger the wound, the less chance of healing normally. So let's say I have, you know, like this pimple that I've got on my face. It's a circular wound. Once it opens up, it's going to take a while to heal. But if I have a cut running down the whole length of my arm, even though that's a linear wound, because it's a larger wound, it usually is still going to take longer to heal than even something like a pimple. Does that make sense? Because the larger volume that you have, the greater chance you have of it not healing normally. Temperature is the key thing. Maintaining body temperature is essential to these wounds. Typically, chronic wounds end up hypothermic, which means they end up colder than normal. Wounds heal best in warm environments. Wounds also heal best with hydration, right? Maintaining its fluid balance is essential. This means the patient also has to stay hydrated. We'll see this a lot in the... Uh, um, subacute setting where we got somebody in a nursing home or something like that, where they're not staying hydrated and the wounds aren't healing. Well, it's because they have to remain hydrated as a body in order to heal normally. So wounds heal best in a moist environment, right? So wounds heal best in a warm, moist 
closed off environment. We're going to talk about that. Necrotic tissue, right? Necrotic tissue is the term for dead tissue. The key thing about dead tissue is it's like the Grateful Dead heads. Um, we'll talk about that, Renee. So salt water has certain antimicrobial effects to it. So it can, it can, but it also can affect someone's negatively. We use salt water for irrigation quite a bit because it helps clean out gunk. And it also has a little bit of a, um, a little bit of an autolytic effect on it. Wouldn't it be like PEMDAS? What, what, why would it be like PEMDAS? I'm confused. Oh yeah, could cancel each other out. You're right, right? Got it. So salt water we will use to clean out and hydrate, but sometimes we just need regular good old fashioned water in the wound. Mainly the body needs good old fashioned water. But yeah, salt water we do use a lot and it does help some wounds. Some wounds we won't. Um, let's say about necrotic tissue. Deadheads like to get together. So those that like the Grateful Dead like to get, to get together. Same thing with dead tissue. Once you start getting some dead tissue, it likes to breed dead tissue. Once tissue dies, it often spreads. That means what should be the option? What should we do with dead tissue as soon as possible in a wound? Yeah, right, we gotta get it out, remove it. So it's important to understand, right? So if maybe you're a PTA and you're seeing a wound for a patient and you're starting to see areas of new necrotic tissue, it's really important to let the PT know so they can get in and debride it as soon as possible because it doesn't take much for that to spread. And now that wound gets 10 times worse than it was, right? Infection, infectious agents hinder normal wound healing because it leaves people in the inflammatory phase, right? The more infection is present, the less likely a wound is to heal. That kind of makes sense, right? If we have an infection present, less likely we will be taking a break here shortly. I can already see Emily's brain kind of frying without even seeing her. The more types of infection present, it becomes even less likely to heal, right? So if you have a patient with a strep infection in the wound and a staph infection on the skin, they would be at risk for a lot of wound complications. Does that make sense? So either the more, more infection we have in that area or the more types of infection, the less likely a patient is to heal. We're gonna go for about 10 more minutes then we'll take a break because then Dr. Ress gonna be popping in. Circulation. It's important to have circulation because impairments in the circulatory system will, repair, will impair all phases of healing. If you don't have good functional circulation, good blood flow can't get there. This is why arterial wounds are very, very problematic. Right? If you get an arterial wound, it's not going to get all the nutrients it needs because the arterial system's impaired. The most important factor in wound healing is the availability of oxygen and perfusion of blood because that's going to bring all the good stuff to the area, right? It's going to bring all of the builders. It's going to bring, you know, all the wood. It's going to bring, you know, the basement, maybe some Bud Light. It's bringing everything along with it to the area to build the house party so that they can rebuild the house that you just broke. If all of a sudden you're in a house and you're out in the middle of Alaska, like the, uh, what is that show that's on Life, Be Life Below Zero? That's the show on, I think it's on National Geographic or whatever. Those people live out in the middle of nowhere. They have no circulation going to them. They have to rely on themselves and sometimes they fail. Well, if you have a wound that, that is that way, it may not heal. Wounds need arteries and blood vessels going to them. Sensation is also important, right? It's one of the reasons I pay attention to this arm quite frequently and I check it quite frequently for wounds. You know, intact sensation, especially fully normal sensation can help prevent further complications in the healing process. If my area is insensate, like my arm is, right? I may not recognize changes in the wound. I may not recognize pressure relief, right? If you have a patient that maybe has a spinal cord injury and can't feel their bottom, and they're constantly sitting on it, it puts them at risk for more pressure injuries. Or we talked about that with Christopher Reeves. It also is, allows for area of increased trauma. So we could end up with another wound that could make it worse. So you need, the patient really needs intact sensation in order to be functional. 
mechanical stress. The more mobile the area, the harder it is to heal. Did anyone ever get like a cut on their elbow, like the tip of their elbow, and it just doesn't seem to want to heal sometimes? Or maybe on the wrist or somewhere that's really, right? Yeah, you get a cut here, you get that paper cut on your fingertip, it heals pretty well, but you get that cut right here between those digits, and it seems to take forever to heal. Well, that's because the more mobile the skin, the harder it is to heal because you're constantly moving it, right? But if you mobilize the area, it may heal faster, but then secondary complications can occur, right? What would happen if, say, I'm letting my elbow heal, so I immobilize my elbow so it can heal? What other problems could occur? Yeah, contractures, right? Now my biceps could contract. These can get stretched weak, right? There's all kinds of things can happen. The other thing is maybe that heals, right? But the scar, instead of being a mobile scar, now binds down to the tissue underneath it. And I end up with that nice scar contracture, right? Where now it's not the muscles that are the problem, it's the skin, right? I've had patients with total knee replacements where they don't, they're not doing their mobility exercises. They're not doing their heel slides. Maybe they're not getting on their CPMs. And that scar then binds down to the top of that kneecap, right? So now that's the problem. It's not that the muscles aren't moving, but that skin is just stuck there and it won't move. Age, younger population obviously heal faster. You guys will heal faster than me, right? And you usually heal more completely. As you get older, your body just breaks down. Nutrition goes hand in hand with hydration. So if you have somebody that's not eating, wound care may not heal, right? So this can be really dangerous in especially like the nursing homes and like that. Why do you think people don't want to eat in the nursing homes? Yeah, sometimes the food is just gross, right? Sometimes I've been in some places, I've been in some hospitals and some nursing homes where the food is fantastic. Very rarely, but I've had some, right? A lot of times it makes you think back to high school, right? You're like, is that meatloaf or is that some sort of a soy byproduct, right? Here's a question, and this is just kind of a hypothetical question. Why if we have requirements for high schools and elementaries and middle schools for nutritional requirements, why don't we have that for old folks? Just a side thought. Right? Why don't we have nutritional requirements in those nursing homes that require them to provide them with certain types of foods? Just, just thought, right? Uh, I've got about five minutes here. Let me finish this section. Sequelae condition. What does sequelae mean again? Yeah, even the food, kid, food, kid, at least the kids' food, though, is nutritious, right, Kelly? For the most part. It, I mean, it's required, but not really. Well, okay, let me rephrase that. The lunches they're supposed to serve them do meet the requirements of the federal government. It may not be the gross, the, the most tasty, but it meets it. Now, some of the other food, yeah, it is kind of gross. What sequelae condition mean? You remember that? We talked about that. Something caused by something. Yeah, good. It's a, yeah, something from a previous injury or previous case, right? So you got a cold and because you've got a cold, um, you cough a lot and you end up with a cut in your throat. That would be a sequelae condition, right? So the more comorbid and co-committant diseases the patient has, the greater the risk of poor healing. Patient has diabetes and high blood pressure. Wound healing is not going to be good, right? Medications. Well, some medications will help wound healing and then some medications won't help wound healing. What type of medications might hinder wound healing? Yes, okay. What's the, what's the technical term for blood thinners? For Mr. McKeever has an aneurysm. Thank you. Right, anti-coags, right? Just saying, I'm just warning you guys because you may not, you, you spelled it pretty close, I think. Yeah. Um, Anticoagulants. Yeah, you got it right. Just, I, I only reason I prepare this is because there is one doc in town, one, one ortho surgeon. I won't mention his name, but if you encounter him and you say blood thinners, he'll go off on you. Not a blood thinner. Water's a blood thinner. Anticoagulants stop the blood from 
clotting. I'm not, I'm not saying anticoagulants. I'm just not saying <laughs> I don't want to out him. Um, I didn't notice that it was a him. Let's just go that way. So that means anticoagulants can slow it. Your um, medications for diabetes can slow wound healing, right? Risk-taking behavior. The more patient adheres to prescriptive wound care precautions and reduces risk-taking behavior, the greater the chance. That means young males are more likely to not heal properly than somebody in their 30s, right? Because we tend to take more risks when we're younger. And then inappropriate wound management. If you're not taking care of your wound, it's likely not to heal. All right, so I'm going to pause, stop sharing here. We're going to take a pause here. All right, so that's the start of it. I'm going to pause recording. All right, so we're back and we're going to talk about starting with soap notes until Dr. Reskin pops in here. So we're going to talk about wound characteristics and describing wounds in soaps, right? Because soaps are a primary form of documentation. Now, some of you probably were out there and saw all kinds of fun EMRs, electronic medical records. And there's no way I can prepare you for all of them, but I can talk about the basic ways to document wounds in soaps, right? It's important to understand that typical wound documentation is going to be done in the metric system. We don't typically measure wounds based upon inches, just to let you know. And that's mainly because our units are gonna be based off of cubic centimeters. So what are we gonna document? Well, wound's exact location. So if we're gonna document a wound, we have to document exactly where that wound is. We're gonna use anatomical terms, right? So if I had a wound here, right? We're gonna document that it's one in centimeter inferior to the right acromioclavicular joint. You've gotta be very specific when talking about where the wounds are. Why is that important? Well, number one, it helps determine if the patient came in with the wound or if we gave it to them in the hospital. The other thing is, is if I have to come in and change the dressing after you, I wanna go right to the right area and not be searching all over the patient's body for the pressure injury. You know, if it's on the inferior angle of the right scapula, it's on the inferior angle of the right scapula. This is why we taught you anatomy. We also want to check the temperature of the, the wound itself and the surrounding tissue. How do we check the temperature of the tissue in, or in the wound and around the wound? What are we going to do? Touch it. Yeah. Right. This is not interior of wound is 94.3 degrees. Exterior of the wound is 92.7. No, literally just touch it. You're looking for feelings of inflammation, right? Then we're going to document, we're going to document, we're going to do a wound measurement here coming up. So don't totally freak out about this yet. We're actually gonna go through. So this is kind of talking through it and then we're gonna do it. We're gonna document the length, width and depth of the wound using the clock method, right? So we're gonna take a clock down off the wall. We're gonna lay it on the wound and we're gonna, no, it's not what we're gonna do. The clock method meaning that we're gonna use, when we talk about the wound, we're gonna talk about it in relation to a, a normal clock. So we may talk about things being at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock. That's based upon the position. If we're looking straight up and down at the wound, if I have a hole at one o'clock in the wound, it's gonna be right over here. And I'm gonna be able to find it. Now, what if you say one o'clock and the next person says two o'clock? Is that a problem? No, we're still looking in the same area. We'll talk about it when we measure it. It is not recommended to take diagonal measurements because it's hard to replicate. We will always use, use perpendiculars. So your first measurement or the length of the wound is gonna be going from 12 to six, straight up and down. That means your width measurement is gonna go somewhere three to nine, crossing that in a perpendicular. And we'll see that when we actually measure one coming up here. This is important to understand that the length and width measurements must be perpendicular. That means if you were forming a length line like this, the width line, uh, width line, width line, width line must be perpendicular to that length line. You can't have the width line like this and the length line like this. Now it's a emergency service announcement. They have to be perpendicular. 
Please make sure you understand that. We can't take a length line at a diagonal either. It has to be straight up and down. We're gonna look for undermining, right? So what is undermining? Undermining is an area where there's tissue not present under the wound edge, where there's a gap between the top layer of the skin and the wound bed itself. So an undermining is if you can take your fingertip or a Q-tip swab, we're gonna talk about tunneling in a second, yep. Because undermining could lead to tunneling. And understand some, um, some clinics will use undermining and tunneling as synonyms. So you have to be careful and understand what your clinics do. I'm going to teach you the specifics of what the book says for undermining and tunneling, and then just understand that you may go out in the clinic and may di be different. So undermining, if this is the edge of my wound and I can kind of get a Q-tip under the edge of the wound, that means I have undermining. If there's space between underneath the edge of the wound and to the basement of the actual wound, the bed of the wound, that's gonna be an undermine. Now you can, with undermine, you can get what's called epibolic edges. Epibolic edges are where the wound itself will roll underneath. So now that's what the edge of my wound looks like. There's skin rolled underneath. Will that ever heal properly if the wound looks like that? No, right? So if we get an epibolic edge, guess what we're gonna have to do to that? Cut it off. Yeah, I'm gonna have to come up, we're gonna have to have PT come in here with a scalpel and cut that so that that edge can go over here and meet this edge. Um, technically, yeah, technically, um, if skin's hanging from your body, that would be an epibolic edge as well. But let me get my little drawer up here. So if I've got, here's my wound bed, right? And here's my skin. If my skin comes over the wound bed, this would be an undermine. Does that make sense? That's why I'm drawing it right now. If the skin here kind of rolls under like that, and I get a roll of skin at the edge here. It may be, a blister technically has epibolic edges, yeah. Um, but not necessarily, not all, epi, not all epiboles are blisters. This would be literally when the skin comes off, you know, skin, so when we have the wound, we have two edges of the wound. These two edges should eventually grow together. But what happens in an epibolic wound or an epibolic edge is instead of growing together, let me get my drawer back up here. The skin kind of rolls like this. And now if these two edges come together, they're not gonna meet because there's not a piece of skin that would merge. Does that make sense? I said, Kaylee freaks out and says, understand it makes sense now. So if you think of my two fingers here, there's my camera. If these two fingers are the separation between the wounds, normally if those edges are fine, they'll just come together like this. An epibolic edge would look like this, where now those two rolled edges come together and they're not gonna meet. So if we notice an epibolic edge, what we're gonna have to do is document it and contact the PT because they're gonna have to come in and cut it. Now the downside to that is with that epibolic edge are probably nerve endings in that edge. So what's gonna happen when we start cutting it? It's gonna hurt, right? So that's really common for epibolic edges to be kind of sensitive to patients. And Dr. Reskin shows up. So let me pause recording here. We're gonna resume recording here. So we're back after Dr. Reskin's little clinical thing. And we're just talking about wounds. So the last thing we talked about was undermining. So undermining is where kind of you have that space underneath. The next thing you have is tunneling. Tunneling is where there's a tunnel going away from the central wound bed and it may lead to another area, right? Another term for a tunnel you may hear in certain areas is called a fistula. A fistula is an abnormal connection between body parts. You could get a fistula in the inner ear 
where you get a hole going from the inner ear to the outer ear that's not supposed to be there, right? So a fistula is an abnormal tunnel going between spaces. But let's say I've got a wound bed that looks something like this. But I start digging around and I realize I've got a chunk going that way. That would be a tunnel. And I'm going to have to measure that tunnel because I need to determine what it's going to do. I need to know if the tunnel stops, right? What if I have that uh, wound in my upper chest and that tunnel goes to my abdomen? That would be a fistula leading to the abdomen because that tunnel is not normally there, right? You could get a fistula in your inguinal ligament, which is, you know, that's where you get that you know, you could get an inguinal hernia where your, your body pushes some of the stuff through the inguinal ligament. That would be a hernia. Hernia technically would be really a fistula now that I think about it. So fistula is the abnormal connection, but it is a tunnel. So when we talk about the wound bed then, we're gonna have to look at the wound bed. And again, we're gonna do one coming up. So this is just so we can describe through it so it makes a little sense when I go through it. We have to describe the wound bed in percentages. What percentage of the wound looks red, beefy, and pink? That would be granulation tissue. Does any of it look yellow, mucousy, kind of um, milky? That's sloth. And then we also have to look for eschar. Is there any area of dead skin? So let's say I have a wound. What would be the total percentage of the wound when I add all of that up? I should get what? 100 percent, right? So if I have 50% granulation, 25% sloth, then I should have a certain percentage of eschar on top of that. The other thing I didn't add on here now that I think about it, but I should have added, and it just happened to think of it, is if there's any bone or, or tissue exposure. So let's say you can see, like I've got a wound on my elbow and you can see my olecranon. You would also want to indicate that you have 10% bone exposure. And we'll talk about that. It's not an exact science. So it's not like if you put 10% and the next person puts 15% that you're wrong. But if three people put 10% and you put 60%, you're probably wrong. Induration or indurated tissue is a hardened, thickened tissue. I don't know if any of you have encountered this, but or if you have any family member that has had a subcutaneous cyst, that would be indurated tissue. It's an area where the tissue is really hard underneath the skin. A wound can get some induration on it where it hardens up. Sometimes the edges of your wound may become indurated, where they become hard and brittle. Again, just like the epibol skin or epibolic skin, if we have indurated skin, what do you think we're going to have to do to it? You have to cut it off. Yep. Edema is swelling. Do we have any swelling in the wound bed? Do we have any swelling in the surrounding tissue? Right, we need to indicate that. And then we get to the wound drainage. This is just like when you talked about with Dr. Reskin with the, um, where you talk, when you talk, check the mucus, right? With wound drainage, you needed to know what the appearance looks like. How much of it's present? Is it moderate? Is it minimal? Is it copious? I love copious. Copious is one of my favorite words. What color is it? Is it brown? Is it green? Is it yellow? Copious means a lot. So on a given day, I drink copious amounts of coffee. If I drink minimal amounts of coffee, it's not a good day for me because then I have too much blood in my caffeine system. So copious is a lot. Um, what color is it? Is it green and pinkish, right? What's the consistency of it? So when I say consistency, what are some terms for consistency? Yeah, thick, right? Is it thick? Is it sticky? Is it thin? Right? 
And then everyone's favorite, you've got to waft it. Smell it. What does it smell like? Does it smell sour? Um, does it have no odor, right? Non-odorous. Um, does it smell like candy? It smells like candy, we may have a problem because what could that indicate? Diabetes, good, right? So there's all kinds of reasons we wanna smell it. Right now, the nurse may look at you funny when you're doing wound care because you might be dabbing out the wound and you pick it up and you're like, <laughs> and the nurse is like, okay, you're weird. But there is a reason for you smelling the stuff that's in the wound. Now, don't be like, that's a little weird, right? Now, with masks nowadays, it does make it a little more difficult, but you can usually get a general odor of a wound pretty easy, right? I guarantee the first time any of you encounter a gangrenous wound, you will never forget the smell of it. Yeah, it has a unique odoriferous emanation. And then the epithelial appendages. What do the hair and nails look like, right? Is it present or missing? We talked about the denuded. Is there evidence of regrowth? Is there some hair popping up? Is there hair where there shouldn't be hair, right? Maybe they got a cut on their fingertip and now the fingertip's growing hair. Would that be normal? No, that would just be weird, unless you're a hobbit, right? Sometimes weird things happen. What's the patient's sensation like, right? The good news here is when we're doing wound care, wound beds of partial thickness or worse usually have impaired sensation. So, you know, this is a, one of the things I talk to a lot of students get a little, they get a little um, gun shy with wounds because they're worried that getting in there and kind of cleaning out the wounds because they're like, dab, 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 dab. No, you got to get in there and kind of scrub out the wound. Good news is most of the nerve endings are dead. So they really don't feel you inside the wound where you'll notice they start feeling you is when you get to the edges. So that's where you're gonna take most of your precaution. Now they may feel the pressure and it may feel uncomfortable, but it's not usually painful. But the surrounding tissue sensation is gonna be normal. So when you get out to those edges of the wound bed, that's where you may take a little bit more um, time with it and kind of be a little gentler, right? Can also use wound tracing sheets, photographic evidence. We use that a lot nowadays where we may take a photo every time with the wound. Now, that doesn't mean that you're doing wound care, you break out your cell phone, and you're like, selfie with a stage two pressure injury, right? No, you don't do that. And you don't live stream, yeah, hashtag wound care, right? You don't you know, live stream to your um, Instagram followers doing wound care on a patient. Now, weirdly enough, I have had patients want it live stream. That is on you guys if you want to. But if they're in a room where there's another patient present, they cannot live stream them doing something. Like they can't live stream you cleaning their foot or something like that because there's another patient and that would violate what rule? The HIPAA, right? Good. So be aware of that. Um, there's volumetric measurements. There's also TBSA or total body surface area, which is the rule of nines. We will get into that in a little bit. So don't totally worry about that yet. This is a neat tool. Has anyone seen this tool before? Be anyone? No one? Oh, Kaylee saw it. Good. Does anyone know who developed anyone? Other than Medline was the company that put prints them. UNLV. Um, doctor, oh my God, drawing a blank right now. He was my advisor at UNLV. They'll come to me eventually. Um, but he's the one that helped develop this. He does a lot of wound care. And now Dr. Chiktelli is also working on this a little bit. This allows you to use it. I mean, it's got pictures of the wounds and that part where the, so this black part in the middle here, uh, let me change color so I can actually see. This part here, actually peels off and underneath it is this piece of plastic that's clear. That way you can lay it down over the wound and take a picture of it and get a nice clear image of what your wound looks like with measurements and everything like that. 
Anyone is a really great tool and it's shown great efficacy. The main thing about this tool is it's usable by not only PTs, but nursing and doctors as well, which makes this a really useful tool. So let's look at a wound here. So this is not a real wound. This is a model. So we're going to take some measurements of this one. We're going to document it. So when we're looking at this wound, one of the first things we're going to have to do is get our length and our width. So we're going to try to figure out, so right about there, looks like can of beans. Right about there is our longest portion of the wound. So I put cephalic at the top because that means it's towards the head. So then we're going to measure that. So we're going to measure from wound, that wound tip to wound tip. So let's say we measure that. Where's my text? And our, we're going to just put some, I'm going to put some measurements over here just so we have it. We'll say it's 18 centimeters width equals. Just so I have some things here to go off of, then we can talk about them. All right. So we're going to say those are the measurements we kind of come up with. If we choose this blue line as our length, I need to make it a little thicker. Need that line needs some thickness to it. If that's our length, our width, we have to find the widest point that is perpendicular to our length line. Does that make sense? Okay. Same thing if we're measuring this, if the top is our head, that means that's going to be 12 o'clock. And down here is going to be 6 o'clock, right? Just like we're looking at a normal clock. So we don't have to say length from 6 to 12 o'clock is 18 centimeters. We just have to put length is, seven, is 18 centimeters. We're going to say the width is six centimeters. I, it's not the actual measurement. I'm just making up numbers. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take and come along here and find the deepest area of the wound. And we're going to measure the depth. I've got a great video on this measuring an actual wound. So I'll, I'll link that video to you guys to watch as well. But, so don't totally freak out yet about this. But now we've got the depth of two centimeters. Great, so we've got the length, we've got the width, we got the depth, right? Then we need to come up with what does the wound look like? So we need those percentages. Let's go with a different color for this. So we know we have some granulation tissue. What would you say the granulation tissue is on this? What percentage of the wound? Give me an estimate. So the granulation is the red beefy tissue. Okay, 70%, that sounds like a good percentage. You'll need to update your Apple Music subscription. Go away. We have some sloth. We also have some eschar. How much bone or exposed tissue do we have? We have 0% of that, right? There's no bone there, right? What would you say is a sloth percentage? So the yellowy fungal looking mouth. Okay, maybe 5%, okay, we'll go with that. 5% sounds good, right? So that means our SCAR then, okay, so Renee says 15. All right, we'll go with 15 because that makes it a little easier. So 70 plus 15 is 85. That means how much SCAR do we have left? 15%, good. It all has to add up to 30% or 100%. And for those of you that are wondering, well, Mr. McKeever, I don't see the sloth. This stuff down here is sloth. What is this stuff over here? 
Is that sloth? It could be, right? We, we may have to look and see if it is. Now, it's, it's really hard to see on this because this is not a real skin, but that could also be, it could be white blood cells, right? Could also just be the fascial layer, adipose. Yeah, so we have to kind of figure out what it is, which means we're going to have to get in there and kind of mess around with a little bit with a Q-tip to see if it actually comes off or if it's like a fascial layer. If the fascial layer, that means that's granulation. We add that back into the granulation. If it's sloth, we add it to the sloth. Now, all this black stuff up here is Eskar. Because, oh my God, I just looked at that picture. Because we have that Eskar, we can't really tell what's under that, right? Because could there be a giant hole under that? Possibly, right? We still need to document that it's Eskar, but it needs to come off. Now, we can't, we have methods we can take it off. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But primarily, it's going to be a PT's job to take that off, right? What else do you see in this wound? You see anything else we may have to document? We'll talk about that in a little bit, Jaira. Yep. Let me erase some of this. Tunneling possible. Good. Where do you see the tunneling at, Kaylee? Okay, it's six o'clock, right? What about at about five o'clock? Do you see another tunnel? Yeah, so what I'm looking at here is I'm guessing, and I'm, I'm going to say I more than guess because I took this picture. There's a tunneling that goes this way at about five o'clock. And then this stuff over here, what do you think this stuff over here is that Kaylee saw, because there is something in there. There's undermining there. So how would you describe the undermine? So what we would do is we're gonna come over here and we're gonna say, let's, we did purple, let's do a different color. We'll do red now. So we're gonna say we have undermining from six to nine o'clock. Does that make sense? Can you guys see from six to nine o'clock? Okay. And then we're gonna say deepest at seven o'clock or two centimeters. The only reason I know that is because I've know what this wound is. I actually measured this wound. So we're gonna, we know, so what that's saying is the undermining runs this whole area over here, but at about seven o'clock, so about there, we measured in and it goes about two centimeters deep. Does that make sense? So far, am I losing anybody yet? Okay, we're gonna do another one, Clarice. So hopefully it'll help make sense a little bit. And actually, like I said, I have a video where I actually measure this that we're gonna look at. We also have to document that tunnel. So let's make tunneling green. So we already know that we said the tunneling is at about five o'clock. What else are we going to have to document about the tunnel? What do you think we might have to document as well? Yeah, the length of the depth of the tunnel, right? So I may say tunneling at five o'clock for five centimeters. So that means it goes in about five centimeters. How am I going to measure that? I'm gonna stick a stick down in that, you swab and measure how far the swab goes in, right? And we're gonna look, right? We also have to see if there's anything down that tunnel, right? What if you look down there and all of a sudden Smeagol's looking out at you? 
My precious, my birthday present. You may have to take Smeagol out. Gollum doesn't belong in the tunnels. I'm joking. If you see a Gollum in a tunnel of a wound, seriously, you need to start wondering what's going through the air in your hospital. Bring your Bible. All right. So what else what might we have to document about this wound? So we got our tunneling, we got our undermining, we got our tissue percentages. Yeah, right. Well, that we have to look at that sloth. What is that sloth looking like, right? So let's do burgundy. So with that sloth, right, or that dead tissue, we have. Would you say that's a? Let's we'll call it a minimal amount. And I would call that yellow. I'm not sure what color you would call it, but I'm going to call it yellow. Um, thick and non-odorous. We're just going to say that's what it is. OK, thank you, Erica. Now we're gonna now I have this broken out into a bunch of little things. We're gonna put this into kind of a soap format when we do it, but you could literally just bullet point this when you're doing it. So you could literally put length and width. Do, 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 do. You don't have to have this in like paragraph format. And I tend to do mine in little breakups. And I have a, a example soap note to show you guys that I did on this. Now. The other thing we're going to document when we're documenting, this is just documenting the wound. The other thing we're going to document is what dressings we put on. We haven't gotten the dressings yet, so that's why I don't talk about that yet. Does this make partial sense to everybody? Okay, so we're going to do another one next. So I just want to, I'm going to clear this stuff here. And we're going to look at another wound. All right, so we got another wound. This is a real one. Okay, this is not me, by the way. Mr. McKeever? Yes. When you measure the wound from like 12 o'clock or like six o'clock, does it always have to be like, like superior? <laughs> well, if you're measuring the wound, so if this is my 12 to six, it at least has to be a straight line from 12 to six. Mm -hmm. I could measure it anywhere on this wound as long as it's a straight line. Does that okay. make sense? Do you always go for like the bigger part of the wound? Yeah, you want to try to get as much of the wound as possible, yes. The one thing you want to kind of avoid is you don't want to do one of these where you say my length is like that. Okay. It has to be straight up and down. And usually it's easier if you use like cephalid to coddle for it, if that makes sense, from the head to foot. So what if the wound is more like diagonal and not so much like circular yep. or rectangle? So let's say I have a wound that looks like this. Yes. <laughs> right? And here's my head. Here's my butt. All right, should I, I should have put foot, but butt sounded so much better. Well, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to find, I'm going to kind of take my little stick and I'm going to come along and find my longest point vertically. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm going to measure that. And then I'm going to find my longest point that I have this way. It's not going to be an exact science. But that's going to give me most of my surface area. Am I going to miss this little section up here in the corner? Yeah. I'm going to miss that little section because if I measure all this, this is literally when I do my when I actually do my square body area, it's going to cover all of that. So it'll make up for it in the areas that are healthy here and healthy here for this part that I'm missing. Does that make sense? OK, are you going to put it in the soap notes that you missed the area or you just... don't have to document. No, okay. you're just going to put the length and width again. The main reason for length and width is we're looking to see if it's getting better and for our billing purposes because we're gonna measure. So let's say I have a wound that is two centimeters by four centimeters, right? 
that's eight centimeters squared. Does that make sense? Because that's based upon area. And I, I want to say that's 16 units because I think it's two units per centimeter squared. But don't quote me on it right now. It's been a while since I build for that. So even though if I say this is two here and this is four here, even though we didn't get this area up here, it'll be made up for the area that we kind of have that we actually aren't part of the wound itself. So it's just, it's, it's a rough estimate. It doesn't have to be perfect. Cool. Let me clean up this mess here. I like, hey, I didn't know I could do this with the eraser. That's cool. Look at that, it's all gone. So let's look at this wound. So this wound, where's my little drawer at? It vanished, there it is. This wound is on somebody's arm. This is the head, this is the feet when we're looking at measurements. That means this wound is going to be wider than it is long. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So now we're going to come in here. We're going to do our measurements. So I'm going to look and what I'm what I'm doing my measurements. I kind of want to poke around until I find the area that I don't want it red. Let's change colors. I want something that'll show up there. It's again, not an exact science, but I wanna kind of find the area that is the longest area. That looks about the closest. And then I wanna find the area that is kind of my widest area. And that looks about the closest. Again, not a perfect exact science, but it's pretty close. So then I'm going to put my little measurements, right? So maybe my length is, I guess I wanna say this is a two centimeter wound. I didn't measure this one. And my width is probably gonna be at least three times that. So we'll say the length, the, the width is six centimeters. So we got our length and our width. Do you think we're gonna have a much depth to this wound? Just looking at it, no. Right, we may, once we get what off of it. The S scar, right? The, the scabby portion. But for now, we, we probably don't have much, right? So let's go back to my purple here. So my so depth. You don't, sorry. Yep, so go you ahead. Don't, you don't include like the red area outside when you well, measure it? Well, that's not an open portion of the wound. Oh, so only the open portion. Oh, okay. The open portion, the exposed portion. Yes, I'm sorry. That's a great question, actually. Yeah, so we're only going to include the exposed portion. Uh, let's move this down here so we can kind of keep it in line. So depth, we're going to say is probably half a centimeter. Let's just say that. So we have our length, we have our width, and our depth. Right? So we got all that. What else are we going to have to measure here? Take those off for now so we can see. Yeah, we're gonna have to estimate our percentages, right? Now looking at this, it's really hard to see the, uh, the granulation tissue, isn't it? Right, because not only do we have eschar, but we got some dried slough. You see the dried slough on the side there? Right, this is all, all this stuff here is dried sloth. It's really a scab is what it is, but it's a different type of scab than dead skin. It's just dried, nasty sloth. Ideally, when we do wound care, what are we gonna try to do to that dead sloth? I'm gonna try to clean it up, get it rid of as much as, as much as we can, right? By cleaning it and kind of dabbing at it and picking at it a little bit. Fun stuff, exactly. So we have granulation, eschar, sloth, bone tissue. Do we have any bone or tissue exposed? 
Nope. Good. So we can say 0% there. So at least that's out of the way. What would you say the SCAR amount is in this one? It's a good chunk of it, wouldn't you think? What kind of percentages are we estimating here? Okay, so I got an 80%. I'll say probably closer to 50, a little bit less than that, maybe 60%. Um, again, it's an estimate. I could, you know, how, you know what I could theoretically do is I could come in here and measure the length and width of that S scar and subtract it out of my total square area and get an accurate measurement if I want it to be really, really anally retentive. I like, so we got between 80 and 40. Let's, let's split the baby and we'll call it 50%. We do have some granulation tissue we can see. You see that little dot of red picky material right in the middle? Does everyone see that? I'm just gonna type these out so that I can then draw on it. I'm going to, I just wanted to write it out because I, I can't go back to it once I've, so this little area, Oh, that's the line. I don't want that. I want my circular drawer. So you have a little bit of granulation tissue right there. Just a little bit of beefy tissue. Just a wee bit. I'm just going to say 5% of beefy tissue. So if we have 50% eschar, 5% granulation, that means sloth is about 45%. It all has to add up to 100. Does that make sense so far? Okay, good. Now, do you think this sloth is gonna have any odor? No, it's dried and crunchy, right? So I would call this a pretty moderate amount of sloth, wouldn't you? Maybe, I wouldn't call it copious because it's not kind of leaking, but I would say a modern amount, hard, dry, non-odorous, right? So that's kind of what I'm looking at. What else do we need? What do you think that edge of that wound bed feels like? Hard, good. But what about the area that's red? Yeah, so we've got, we may indicate that the wound edges are what? Warm or what, what, what could we say they are? Because na red, nasty and angry. Wound edges are inflamed, yeah. Right, that's, that's, a, that's a mean, nasty wound there. We got a lot of work to do on this wound to kind of keep it clean. We're also going to, have to document where it's at, right? So this one was two centimeters distal to the guy's elbow. So that means it's going to be down on the forearm. What do you think this probably was looking at the wound? How do you think he did this? Yeah, it's probably, it's, it's a road rash is what it is, or maybe it's a carpet burn or something to that effect. That's all this is, curling iron. Could be that too, yeah, I mean, it could be, right? It's just something, you know, he may have been over the preacher bench, right? And doing curls and got it back, you know, back on the back of the arm there. Does that make sense for this overall? We're, again, we have a, I have a whole video on this, so I, I just want to do a quick dry and dirty version of it. Does that make a little bit more sense now for you guys? Do we have any, any tunneling, any undermining? Not really at this point, right? We won't know until we get that SCAR off. So that's about all we can do for this wound. And we're going to clean it. We're going to dress it. 
Mm. So what I want you guys to do for me, yeah, fun. What I would like you guys to do for me for Monday is in your spare time, your spare time, but before Monday, take a look at this wound and do your estimates on it. It's gonna be hard to do measurements. Um, so just estimate it, look at it, tell me what you see and kind of write it up. And we're gonna do this as a group, this one on Monday. So I just wanna save this one for kind of a practice one. So Monday, take a look at, the, by Monday, take a look at this wound and just do me a write, write up, a, I don't, you have to turn it in. You have nothing to turn in, but Monday we'll kind of go over this as a group. Does that make sense? Just a little practice for at home. Mm. What kind of wound is that? Does anyone know? Something's afoot. It's diabetic. It's the cutest ulcer. All right. Do we need a break? Is that a praying mantis? It looks like it. Do we need a break, guys? Is everyone starting to fray? Okay. Let's take a, let me pause the recording here. All right, so I'm gonna start recording again and we'll get going here. So we talked about kind of how to document the wound in the soap notes. So now let's talk about like wound bed preparation. And one of the uh, acronyms we use with wound bed preparation is talking about the time. So we talk about the tissue, inflammation and infection, moisture management and edges. So for the tissue, we're going to look at the tissue and we want to get rid of non-viable or any foreign material in the actual wound. So we need to get rid of necrotic tissue. We have to get rid of any old dressings that are in it. We don't want to leave old dressings lay there for a while. We might have to remove any biofilm or sloth that's in it. We want to get rid of any exudate, any excess fluid that's there, and then debris. We got to get out of that wound bed when we're dressing it. This is when we clean it. Infection, we gotta look to see if there's any infection in it. We may have to assess if we think that the wound bed needs antibiotic, right? If we start smelling the wound kind of smells funny and we're seeing a lot of slough building up, the wound may need some antibiotic. Does that mean we order it as PTAs? Nope. That's when we may either say to the, doc the wound care doctor or maybe say to our PT, hey, I think Joe in uh, 204 could probably use some antibiotic on that foot. And then the doc has to order it. Um, maybe we might switch dressings based upon that. We have different dressings that can help with infections as well. Those we may not need a prescription for until we get the antibiotic. If we have too much inflammation, what can we do to lower the inflammation? What kind of modalities can we use to lower inflammation? If we see excess inflammation. Yeah, we can use some cold, right? Definitely. Could use an ice pet or an ice massage right around the edges of the wound bed. There are things we can do to kind of reduce inflammation. We got to manage the moisture. So we need to get rid of excess bodily fluids in the wound, but we also have to donate moisture to the wound to make sure it's a nice, warm, moist wound bed. I love the word moist because it makes people uncomfortable. And then the edges, we have to look at the surrounding skin around the wound and kind of look at it and make sure it's good, healthy skin. What if the skin is kind of dry around the wound bed? Like, so around the edges, the skin that we know that's eventually gonna have to close and it's dry. What do you think we might wanna do to that skin? Well, we may have to cut it off, it's totally dry. If it's not totally non-viable, we may have to moisten it, right? We may use some of the stuff we use to moisten the bed of the wound to moisten the edge of the wound we may put some skin barrier cream on the edges of those wounds. Because sometimes what happens is when we put that bandage down, Z-Guard, exactly. We put that bandage down for whatever reason, the um, adhesive of the bandage, they just react to it weird and it dries the skin out a little bit. So we may have to protect the edges of the wound bed. Some people just don't react well to adhesives. So wound debridement itself, which is I told, uh, I think it was Jared that was questioned about, this is where we kind of get into what can we do. Wound debridement is not only a physical therapist's responsibility. PTAs can perform certain forms of debridement and it may vary based state to state. 
So it's very important to understand your state's practice act. In Nevada, Nevada defaults to the APTA guidelines. And this is the APTA statement from the House of Delegates. Interventions performed exclusively by physical therapists include interventions that require immediate, continuous examination and evaluation through the intervention. Such procedural interventions are within the scope of the physical therapist practice that are performed exclusively by physical therapists, include, but are not limited to, spinal and peripheral joint mobs, which are a component of manual therapy, and sharp selective debridement which is a component of wound care. So Sharpe's debridement typically includes scalpers, scalpel, scissors, or forceps, but some states may indicate that only metal versions of these tools are Sharpe's. I worked in a state where PTAs could do debridement as long as the tools were plastic. Now, I can already hear some of your heads turning going, well, wait a minute, wouldn't a plastic scalpel be just as sharp as a metal scalpel? Absolutely. But they made it so that PTA, and why did they do that? Well, because the PTs and the board said, hey, we need help with this wound care. We can't do it all. So it's just, you have to be aware of your state's practice act. In Nevada, they're a little bit more liberal with PTAs doing wound care. They still don't want you doing Sharps debridement. That's just, they just default to the APTA standards. It could change in the future though, as PTAs don't wanna do it. So cleaning out that wound is one of the first things a therapist, PT or PTA have to do in wound care. Granulation tissue, new beefy tissue will not grow over slough or eschar. So we have to get it out. We used to do wet the dry dressings. It used to be the standard for wound debridement, but as time progressed, standards have progressed as well. So wet the dry dressing, for those that don't know, was you put a sticky wet gauze on the wound bed, you'd cover it up and you'd leave it until that gauze was completely dry. And once that gauze was dry, then you'd rip that gauze out of the wound bed. Does anyone see a problem with that? Yeah, Jared's like fun, right? The problem with that, yeah, it could, it could take off healthy skin. That's the problem with it. Now, there are still some docs in town that this is their preferred method of wound debridement. If the doc says that, then we do it. But we just know that it takes off granulation tissue too. So we don't like to do this anymore. We have more tools at our disposal than we did back when this was, you know, when we were riding dinosaurs to school. All dressings that are used to clean out wounds or that were in wounds at any given point should be considered biohazardous and thus deposited in the biohazard waste receptacles. How do you know what a biohazard waste receptacle looks like? What color is it usually? Yeah, it's red, right? That's also like the Sharps debridement or the Sharps container is usually red. So like in the case in the state I worked at, when we did Sharps debridement with plastic tools, once we were done with those, we had two different things. We had the waste material from the wound bed and then we had our sharps. Our sharps went in the sharps container and the, all the gunk that we got out of the wound went in another red pack that we use. So they get disposed of appropriately. What do we really have to do with biohazardous waste? How do we have to dispose of it? Or how should it be disposed of? Let's put it that way. Not necessarily from you guys, but Usually it has to be burnt, it has to be incinerated. Yeah, right? Because we don't want to take somebody that's got a, you know, some really, really weird, funky disease, put it in a bag and then throw it on a dump where, you know, rats can come along and eat that stuff and then pass it back to humans until the plagues happen. So there are two methods of, where do they, they usually, most hospitals have an incinerator downstairs or they have an on, off-site incinerator. So it depends. Um, like the hospital I worked at in Pennsylvania had a huge incinerator that wasn't in the hospital, but they had a building that was off to it that was an incinerator. But they also had a uh, crem crematorium there too. So it doubled as an incinerator for waste and also for bodies. Because technically human bodies would be considered biohazardous waste, right? Why do we put human bodies in the ground? Think about that for just a, just a brief moment. Like think about that for just a moment. Why do we put human bodies into the ground? 
right? Does anyone else see? If, I don't know. Maybe I'm just thinking too much into it, right? So we got lots of people dying of COVID and we're sticking them into the ground. It is a circle of life, Renee, but we're biodegradable. But just think about all those bodies that have COVID that are now decaying in the bot in the ground and could get absorbed by worms. Those worms could get eaten by birds. Those birds could, you know, I'm just saying. Just a thought process. Just a thought process. I'm not saying anything. So the two methods of debridement are selective and non-selective debridement. So this is not to be considered types. We're going to talk about the types, but the two methods are selective and non-selective. Selective debridement is exactly like it sounds. We're going to select a very specific area to debride, right? Scalpel debridement is an excellent example of it, or enzymatic debridement is an excellent example. So maybe um, I've got an injury on my forearm here. It's the whole area, but I just have one area of infection. Well, selective debridement, we're just going to work on that area, right? Non-selective debridement is not as honed in and may just take care of the whole wound. Whirlpools are an excellent example of non-selective debridement, where I put my arm down in a whirlpool and the water sloshing around debrides my wound. Once we have the methods down, selective versus non-selective, then we talk about the five primary types of debridement. Asterisk these slides, please, because these are very important for your boards. The first type of debridement is called autolytic. Autolytic is the slowest method, usually has no pain and uses the body's own enzymes or natural occurring enzymes or moisture beneath the dressing to get the gunk out. So technically a wet to dry dressing technically is considered autolytic debridement. Um, better terms, has any of you seen Meta Honey before? Or, you know, if any of you have had a wet, if any of you have ever had your legs waxed, technically that's autolytic debridement of your hair. That's technically autolytic debridement of your hair, where whether it's your arms, your legs, or anywhere else you've had debrided, right? The tissue kind of breaks down, gets stuck to it, and you pull it off. So, autolytic basically uses typically your own body's enzymes or a natural occurring enzyme. Meta honey is an excellent example. Meta honey is nothing more than ho sterile honey that you put on it. And honey has some really neat um, biological things that help with wounds. I mean, meta honey is fantastic. I love meta honey. It works great. And you know, if your blood sugar is low, B barf, exactly. And if your blood sugar is low, you can just take some of the meta honey and eat it. No, don't do that. I love that new Jake from State Farm commercial though with the the bees. That's fantastic. You can eat the chunk honey. Um, enzymatic now. Enzymatic's a little different. Now enzymatic, we're starting to get in some chemicals. We're going to apply a prescribed topical agent that liquefies necrotic tissue with enzymes. This typically will require a prescription. Santil is an excellent enzymatic debrider that you'll see very frequently in wound care. You cannot use the wound care cart Santil on a person unless that person's got a prescription for it. It dissolves and devitalizes that devitalized tissue and makes it kind of gooey and soup-like, and then you can scoop the soup out. Depending upon the insurance, they may not cover enzymatic debridement. A lot of insurance carriers right now are only covering autolytic debridement, so we're using a lot more meta honey than we used to. Doesn't matter if it's autolytic or enzymatic, both of them are gonna dissolve the tissue we don't want and turn it into goop that we get out. Um, both of those pretty much are really well used in long-term care settings because they're mostly pain-free. You don't feel the enzyme breaking it down. You don't feel the meta honey breaking down the gunk. It just kind of breaks down and then we kind of wash it out. Sharps debridement is another form. Sharps debridement is performed by skilled practitioners using surgical instruments, such as scalpels, a curette, scissors, a ronger, or forceps. It's where we're getting in and we're going to be cutting out the stuff and pulling it off. I actually like sharps debridement. I'm weird that I, I like to do that. It's fun. 
it promotes wound healing by removing all that biofilm in the vitalized tissue, right? The level of debris is determined by the level of vitalized tissue. We may have to take out a huge chunk of skin to get all the dead tissue out. It's just the way it is. Surgical debridement is the most aggressive form of sharp debridement where they take them into surgery and they may have to anesthetize them or something like that in order to remove that tissue. The downside with sharps debridement, what do you think you're going to have as a side effect of doing sharps debridement from the patient's standpoint? Pain. Yeah, because you're cutting into their skin, right? Or you're taking the forceps and literally yanking off the gunk, right? Did anyone ever pull off a scab before it was ready and you pull it off and it hurts like heck, right? That's kind of what you're doing, right? It doesn't feel good. Sometimes we can prescribe topical anesthetics. Renee's like, I love it. We need to have a talk after class, Renee. I'm starting to worry. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we can use topical anesthetics when doing sharps debridement, but we often don't want to because then they may not feel in case we get too deep or something like that. The other thing is, in order for a topical anesthetic to be used, what are we going to have to have from the doctor? Yeah, an order and scripts. Exactly, right? We can't just go get, you know, now granted, nowadays today, you could go down to Walgreens and buy lidocaine, right? They have all kinds of lidocaine rubs and patches and stuff like that that you could theoretically buy and put on the patient. We can't do that in the Medi-Cal setting. But if we have to use lidocaine, we have to use sterile lidocaine and it has to be from orders. So we've talked about autolytic, we've talked about enzymatic. Now we're gonna talk about sharps, or we talked about sharps. Now we're gonna talk about mechanical debridement. Mechanical debridement is de debridement by irrigation hydrotherapy with the dry dressings and an abraded technique. So when we initially put that fluid in with the wet the dry dressing, that is starting the mechanical debridement. When it breaks down and we pull it off, that would be autolytic. It can be cost effective. It can also damage healthy tissue and usually is painful when you use it. Um, one of the first patients I saw when I was doing an uh, acute care setting, so my clinical affiliations, I rode motorcycles, so to and from clinical, and the nurses like to pick on me and they're like, oh, you're gonna get in a motorcycle accident. The first one we did was this guy that was going 70 miles an hour on the interstate and his tire blew. And he slid for about 400 feet on his back and he had no gear on. He was wearing a tank top. So his tank top became part of his skin. Yeah, kill his dummy, exactly. Now I always wore gear, but that's beside the point. That tank top became part of his skin. So one of the things we had to do was mechanical and sharp debridement on his back. So we had to take him downstairs and put him on this giant table and basically had to pressure wash his back with a high pressure hose. You can imagine what that felt like. Yeah, Emily's like, ouch, yeah. About 40 seconds into it, the guy passed out from pain. Right? Pulse lavage is a version of mechanical debridement. Pulse lavage is something the PTAs can do. Did any of you see anyone doing pulse lavage before? Pulse lavage is what I like to call a super soaker with suction. So pulse lavage is literally a water gun that you hook up to a giant bag of saline and then you hook it up to the suction in the wall in the hospital. So it has this little cup that you put over the wound care area and it blasts water into the wound. And that water blasting into the wound, dentist does, yeah, actually technically, yeah. Technically that spray that dentist uses on your teeth or what's, what's that new thing called that you can use for floss, the dental pick or whatever, water pick. That's technically pulse lavage if it has suction. I don't think the water pick has suction, but anyway, um, some of those ear cleaners, are technically pulse lavage. The ones that can kind of spray warm water down and then sucks the goop back out. That would be technically pulse lavage. So again, we had autolytic, we had enzymatic, we have sharps, we have mechanical. And then my favorite is biological. 
biological, we use maggots, specifically Lucilla seretica or the green bottle fly. We grow them in a sterile environment and then they're used to di digest dead tissue. The funny thing about maggots is they do not eat live tissue. They will never gorge on live tissue. Sterile maggots are applied to the wound bed and then you put a dressing over them to confine them into the wound. And then they eat all the dead tissue. Yeah, you can find them. So if you have a hole in your arm, you fill up the hole with maggots, you cover it up so they can't get out. And then they just eat all that dead tissue in the wound. It actually is used more frequently than you think. Um, well, Emily, I'm not gonna watch the video. There is a link to a video from National Geographic about it that you guys can watch on your own. That link is on this here. Um, did I told, did I tell you guys this, the story about the patient that I had with this? I don't know if I told you the guy with the foot. Did I tell you that story? So I had a patient at, um, one of the long-term care facilities here in town when I worked for Kindred. It was me and actually Dr. Chikatelli, who's the wind care guy I talked about. He used to be one of our instructors. The first time I met him, we had this guy and we're going to call him Bob. Bob had a decubitus ulcer on his foot. But Bob was also wheelchair bound and had pressure injuries on his palms. So he didn't like using the wheelchair wheels. So the way he propelled himself around the hospital was with his feet. So he sat in his wheelchair and he pulled himself around and Bob was a smoker. So Bob, and this is when they actually had smoking areas at these places. They don't have those so much anymore. So Bob would get out, get into his wheelchair. He'd transfer himself pretty well. He'd go out to the smoking area and smoke all day. Well, uh, Dr. Tilly changed his dressing on Thursday and I saw him on Monday, I think it was. I came to see him and he's like, I'm like, how's your foot feeling? And he's like, you know what? My foot feels really good. It's probably the best it's felt in a while. That's interesting. He's always complaining about the pain. So I get his foot up to change his dressing and I look at the dressing and the dressing is moving. Like literally you can see undulation under the dressing. And so I'm like, hmm, put on some gloves, get ready for the dressing. I pop that dressing off and sure enough, probably seven, 800 maggots fell out of the wound. just plop right onto the pile of my blue uh, cat sheet. And he's like, what's that? I'm like, those are fly larvae. So he had gone out and was pulling himself along on the ground and at some point pulled his dressing just enough that a fly got into that wound and laid eggs. The wound was the most beautiful wound I have ever seen in my life. It was perfectly denuded, cleaned, looked gorgeous. The bone was nice and shiny. They had cleaned all the gunk off because he had exposed bone. Yep. And so I, I called one of the other wound care therapists over and they're like, how about that? And believe it or not, he actually ended up keeping his foot probably because of it. He might've lost his foot otherwise, but they cleaned out so much of the gangrene he had there. It, he kept his, I don't know if he'd kept it for long because he probably did something stupid later on, but it was wild. Um, I showed one of the nurses and she promptly threw up for like two hours, but it was wild. The maggots had cleaned everything out. There was nothing wrong with the foot. They didn't give him an infection because they only eat dead tissue. Now I'm probably guessing that, you know, uh, you guys are kind of getting nauseated. It was actually really cool. Emily, you, you probably would not have handled that very well, but it was actually really neat looking to me. And like I said, there is a video there for you guys to watch about it. I'm not gonna make people watch it yet. So how do we prevent wound infections? Hand washing is number one. I don't do bugs. Yeah, I don't really do bugs either, but that's neat to me. I don't know why that one doesn't bug me. Now I can't eat, wait to eat breakfast. Exactly. Just think of that oatmeal. Um, 
hand washing is number one. We use standard precautions when it comes to wound care, meaning we use a clean technique. The only time we'll use sterile technique is for specific wounds as designated by the doctor or specific patients. Patients that are autoimmune compromised, oftentimes we're gonna use a sterile technique. And if you remember back from rehab one, clean technique is our gloves or you know, maybe our mask, washing our hands, stuff like that. Sterile technique is where we use all the one use equipment. So a lot of times in sterile technique, the, everything we use is gonna either be thrown out or sanitized at the end. We also wanna dispose of any used or soiled materials as soon as possible. And we wanna minimize the wound bed's exposure to the environment by performing wound care in a safe and efficient manner. Meaning if we have to get wound care measurements, which we do on every patient, we have to do it quick. We don't want to leave that patient. It's not like we're going to open that patient's wound up to change the wound dressing and be like calling everyone in from the hospital to come look at it. Now, I did with the maggots because that was actually kind of cool, but also he had no dead tissue in there anymore. It was actually really neat looking, right? But we want to, we want to get really good at wound care. This is a viable career path as a PTA. And I can say for those of you that might be, you know, that, oh my God, transferring patients all day long is too much for my back. Wound care, you don't do a lot about this. Most of the time you're in out of the patient's room in 10, 15 minutes. You get it good at it. You're in, out, you maybe see 20 to 25 patients a day, but you're just treating wounds. The main reasons why I got here, exactly. Wound care is fun. So we talked about clean technique, right? We're gonna open the supplies just prior to use and remaining supplies should remain sealed. That means we don't wanna open up extra gauze containers unless we know we're gonna use them, right? Meds should be all labeled and stored correctly and separated. You don't wanna pull out Santil for patient Bob and mix it with Santil for patient Judy. They have to be separate and distinct, right? Wounds should be kept covered except during examination. Let's say you're changing a dressing, but you have to get the PT to look at it real quick. And you have to step out of the room. What should you do to that wound before you step out of the room? Cover it, yeah. Maybe put a temporary dressing over it for a while. Maybe lay one of the blue chucks over it so it's completely, or just completely dress it, right? The worst that can happen is you redress it. Emily's right. Right? I've done that where I'm like, man, I need the PT to look at this. And you know, I tell the nurse, the nurse can't get a hold of the PT or whatever. So then I dress the wound, go get the PT, undress it, and then just redress it. Right? Uh, dressing should be changed when contaminated or ineffective. Most, does anyone know what most hospitals, how frequently dressings have to be changed? Kaylee says every day, that would be ideal. Could be two times a day, right? Those bowel movements, yeah. Now, at least every other would be ideal. Kelly's exactly right. At least every other would be the most ideal. If we can change them every day, that's probably the most beneficial. But at least every other day we should be changing them. Now, if we have a long-term dressing like a wound back or something like that, it may last longer, but at least every other day. We also wanna make sure we discard any gowns, gloves, masks, anything like that in appropriate disposal. Don't just throw them in the trash. Nothing irritates me more than going into a room where a nurse has changed the dressing, the dressings are in the regular trash. That makes me angry. You don't like me when I'm angry. Preferred method for doing wound care, right? So you're gonna come in, introduce yourself to the patient, get your objective or subjective findings. How you doing? How's your pain? What's it feel like? All that normal stuff and get your consent. Then you're going to wash your hands and put your gloves on. Then you're going to bring all of your supplies. Usually wound care has a wound care card. Get all supplies you need for the patient into the area where you're treating the patient and set up a clean environment. Again, I have a video on this. I'm going to link to you guys. Once you have your area set up, you're going to remove all the old dressings and they're going to go in what type of a bag? All the old dressings are going to a biohazard bag, good. Then we're going to clean out the wound, right? We may clean it with wound cleanser. We may clean it with saline. I'll talk about that specifically in a little bit. Now, it depends upon your clinic. At this point, they may have you wash your hands at that point. 
I don't like to do that. I like to measure my wound before I wash my hands a second time. Mainly because that way I get all of my old stuff out of the way. So I measure my wound, I get all my measurements. Now, most of the time when I am doing wound care, I mean, you could have one, some, some PTs keep grease pencils to write stuff down with. I usually ask the patient if it's okay that I can record myself, not video, but audio recording. Cause then I'll speak into my phone and say, you know, patient room 202, wound depth is two centimeters, wound length is eight centimeters, blah, blah. And I just record my findings on my phone because my hands are all messy from cleaning out the wound. I don't wanna reach over and write stuff down or type stuff into a computer, right? There are multiple ways you can do this. Once you've got your measurements and all your objective findings for the wound, then you're gonna wash your hands again. Take your, well, first of all, take your old gloves off, right? Wash your hands again, dawn on new gloves, put new clean gloves on, because now you're changing the dressing. So now we're gonna pack the wound meaning we're gonna make sure there's no dead space in the wound. Then we're gonna take our secondary dressing, which we'll talk about in a second, initial and date the outside of the secondary dressing. Yes, you are gonna sign your patients. And then you're gonna apply the secondary dressing. So there is an order to this. And this is the preferred order for most of our clinics that are out there. Again, we wanna help maintain that moist, warm environment in that wound. Keep it closed. Wounds heal three to five times faster in a moist, covered, warm wound bed versus leaving the wound open to the air. When I came up and I was growing up, for some reason, my parents were the belief that you leave the wound open to the air. You just let it open. Let it breathe is what they used to say. Well, we now know that's not a good idea because that lets uh, infections in. Your outer dressing also help perfect, prevent patients from getting bodily fluid. I think Kaylee mentioned it about the you know, patients you know, peeing and pooping on themselves. You don't wanna get that in the wounds. It also keeps stuff like, I know it's a saliva, but if you've got a patient with a wound on their chest or on their neck and they're drooling, that saliva has some stuff in it too. If your patients have pets, you definitely wanna make sure that wound bed is covered because I can guarantee especially if you have a little dog or something like that, that dog is going to find that wound and lick it for some unknown reason. Cats tend to too as well. Dry wound beds tend to be uncomfortable for a patient, right? Think about when you guys have dry skin, how it feels, it doesn't feel the best. Same thing for dry wound beds. Antimicrobials should only be used sparingly. So antimicrobials are gonna be antivirals, antifungals, antibacteria, antibac... Oh my God, why can't... Antibiotics, I can't speak today. Why do we wanna use them sparingly? Because the patient can become resistant to them, right? MRSA is an excellent example, right? Methicillin resistance, staphylococcal aureus. Should be discontinued once the wound appears to no longer be presenting with an infection agent. Some clinicians, especially certain PTs, just want broad spectrum antibiotics ordered prophylactically, even with no signs of infection. Um, Mucipros, Mupi, Mupa, I have that one down there is a great example of it. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic. But again, if we apply that to every single patient, we're going to develop resistance to it. So you don't want to do that. The PT orders it, you do what the PT says. But once you start seeing that there's no infection, we really shouldn't be doing any of those. So here's a list of pretty much all of your standard topical applicants. So, Mr. McKeever, what do I have to know about this for my test for this semester? Not necessarily all of it, right? We've talked about Santil. We talked about medical grade honey, right? But this kind of talks about all the stuff that is out there. If you're going to a wound care clinic, I would take this with you so that you can have some ideas for it. This is talking about the different uses for the different topical agents, right? What do I want you to know? I know that I want you to know that Santil or collagenase is an enzyme. What's Santil gonna do to the wound? Santil's gonna liquefy. It's 
an enzyme, it's an enzymatic. The problem with that is it's not specific, which means it can also liquefy healthy tissue. So you don't want to constantly use Santil, right? Lidocaine, pain reliever, it's an anesthetic, medical grade honey. What type of uh, debridement tool is medical grade honey? Not an enzymatic, it's a autolytic. Good. All right. Great job, Kaylee. It can also have some microbial effects. That's why I said medical grade honey is some amazing stuff. Silver is another stuff we might use on the wounds we'll talk about. So the most important thing, we, this is probably the most important thing you're going to have to do as a wound care specialist if you do it. Choosing your dressings. How do you choose your dressings as a PTA? The best option is to choose what the PT did before you. Makes it simple, right? The idea of wound dressing should be to create that moist environment. We have the Goldilocks principle here. It can't be too much moisture. It can't be too little moisture. It's gotta be just right. Prevent and provide thermal insulation. Provides a barrier to the microorganisms. And it's going to protect the exposed nerves to decrease associated pain. It, the more, most important thing here is we have to eliminate dead space. If I have a hole in my arm, you have to make sure that dead space is filled with dressings. You also want to get rid of any debris, necrotic tissue, or anything like that. So when we are dressing a wound, we have a primary dressing and a secondary dressing. The primary dressing is going to meet the wound bed or in the skin itself. Right. When I think of a primary dressing, I think of that gauze portion of the white portion of the Band-Aid. Does that make sense? The secondary dressing is going to cover and provide protection, cushioning, and absorption for the primary dressing. When I think of the brown or the sticky portion of the Band-Aid, that is your secondary dressing. So technically, a Band-Aid is a primary and secondary dressing in one. Right? If I'm filling a wound up with gauze, the gauze is my primary dressing, and then I put a cover over it, that would be my secondary dressing. Well, how do I choose this stuff? Well, it depends upon if you want moisture retentive or non-moisture retentive, meaning does it keep the moisture or does it give it away, right? We have to keep the bed optional or optimal for healing, allow gas exchange, but also keep the wound clean and trap fluid that we want to get away from it to prevent maceration or the kind of that curling of skin. Maceration, again, is what your fingers look like when you get out of the tub. This is from least to most absorbative. We're going to go through all of these, but I just put a list together. So gauze, impregnated gauze, films, hydrogels, foams, hydrocolids, and alginates. We'll talk through those in a little bit. I think we talk actually through those Monday. From least blocking to most blocking, is this list. And again, we're going to go through each of these. Gauze is pretty much the primary choice that we use for dressing wounds. The reason we use gauze for everything is it's cheap, right? You can get a pack of four by four gauzes for less than 50 cents if you really wanted to, right? It's really good for draining wounds and we can impregnate it. What does impregnation mean, do you think? when it comes to dressings, wet it, right? Yeah, impregnation means it's got something in it. We can impregnate it with saline. We can impregnate it with something like Vaseline. Any of those can be impregnated gauze. If you impregnate the gauze, it has to have a dressing over it in order to keep that impregnation in the wound. And we'll talk about why we would use impregnated gauze versus non-impregnated gauze coming up. This is just a thousand foot view. Hydrogels are water or glycerin base and they donate moisture to the wound. If we have a dry wound, if you see any questions talking about a dry wound bed, you should be thinking hydrogel. Hydrogel is typically water or glycerin base. It kind of looks like that stuff on the person's skin over there. I often think of hydrogel as kind of like clear skin lotion. It is going to donate moisture to the wound bed because sometimes wound beds do get too dry. Most of the time you can tell if it's hydrogel because it's labeled 
guess what? Hydrogel makes it easy. I have seen now meta honey with hydrogel in it so that you can use the effects of meta honey, but also donate moisture. Your foams are hydrophilic on one side and hydrophobic on the other. What does hydrophilic and hydrophobic mean? What's hydrophilic mean? Does anyone know? Hydrophilic absorb moisture, right? Right. So the, the shirt I'm wearing right now is a sports shirt. It is hydrophilic. It's going to wick my moisture away from my skin. Hydrophobic would repel, right? So if I have a shirt that's hydrophobic, all my sweat's going to stick to me. I'm probably going to start stinking. Foams are also useful for protection and cushioning. Let's say I have a really, really bad pressure injury on my tailbone. I'm going to be sitting down on that. So I probably want to put a foam over it in order to give a little bit of cushioning back there. Hydrocolid is a little different. Hydrocolid absorbs fluid slowly by swelling into a gel-like mass. These are kind of gross. The one side is typically impermeable to water, O2, and bacteria. So it'll protect a wound and keep stuff from getting into the wound. The other side is going to kind of swell up with fluid as it sucks the fluid out of the wound. I use a lot of hydrocolids on patients with pressure injuries on the butts because that way if they're incontinent, it doesn't get into the wound. The last thing you want is fecal matter in your wound. We have our alginates. Alginates, I like to think of as really, really funky looking gauze. Um, or if you're somebody that does um, sewing or like uh, any type of stuff like that, alginates are your batting that you put inside stuff. That's really what alginates are, right? Alginates are really permeable, very low occlusive, but super absorbative. This little square here can absorb 20 times its weight in drainage. So if you have a heavily draining wound, you're going to want an alginate to help absorb some of that stuff out. Other things we may do with wounds. We may irrigate them with wound irrigation. We may do whirlpool, um, pulse lavage, e-stim, ultrasound. We're going to talk briefly about negative pressure therapy, but we're going to have a whole class on that. We may do hyperbaric oxygen treatment or HBO treatment, right? That's not when you get to watch last week tonight. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment is where we flood an area with oxygen. Typically, you're going to flood the whole body with oxygen and put them in a hyperbaric chamber. And then obviously, routine physical and occupational therapy. If they're being seen for wound care, they probably should also be seen for regular physical therapy. The good news is if you're doing wound care, you're typically not doing regular physical therapy. You're probably going to just go and do the wound care, and then the regular physical therapist or PTA is going to come in and treat them for routine physical therapy. Now, if the patient has to get up and go to the bathroom and you're there to do wound care, take them to the bathroom. Don't just be like, oh, I can't help you with that. Call the nurse. Help your patients out. Negative pressure therapy. Did anyone see wound vacs? This is where we're going to finish kind of the day off. Did anyone see a wound vac out there? Kaylee seen it. Wound vacs are becoming more and more popular. So a wound vac is called negative pressure wound therapy, or NPWT. What a wound vac does is it closes off and protects the, heat, the wound environment and provides a negative pressure or a sucking force. That sucking force is going to help pull those edges of the wound together and speed along healing. It's also going to be constantly removing any excess fluid, any dead tissue, anything like that. And because it has suction on it, it's going to be pulling blood through the capillaries. So that means it's going to help improve blood flow to that wound. And it, the big thing is it's going to facilitate wound contraction. Before we can do any type of wound vac or negative pressure therapy, we first of all have to debride the wound and get rid of all non-viable tissue or get it down to at least less than 20%. Now, if we have some in there that's loose, it'll eventually come off with negative pressure therapy. We're then going to fill the wound with sterile foam and pack everything we can. Then we're going to drape it with a film 
and activate the pump. Usually wound vacs are on for two to three days. Uh, most of the clinics in town here, if they do wound vac therapy are usually three days because that provides therapy over the weekend in case you change the dressing on Friday, <coughs> excuse me. That means you can come back and change the dressing on Monday and still be fine. Look at that. The pump is activated to about 125 millimeters of mercury. What does that look like? Wonder why we'd pick that pressure. What do you think? What does that look like? Where have we seen around 125 millimeters of mercury before? Maybe seeing less than 120 and less than 80 millimeters of mercury. Oh, it just hit blood pressure. Good, right? 125 millimeters of mercury is just above normal resting blood pressure. So that's going to help suck some of that blood into that wound area to help improve the overall healing. This is kind of what it looks like. And again, we're actually going to cover out in depth with this in a little bit. But the interesting thing about this is this really does help. And we've seen a lot of positive results with keeping from getting nasty scars by doing wound vac therapy. When we do wound vac therapy, it helps really approximate those edges. It makes things heal a little bit better. That was a lot of stuff. Anyone else burn out? Other than Emily, because Emily's got her kid running around. <clears throat> Ding dong, somebody just showed up. Are there any questions about general wound care? Again, we're gonna go through how to do a wound care these are in sixth grade math. Uh, well, as long as if math is that new core, that new core math, I agree with you. <clears throat> so we're going to go through with a couple of days on this. We're going to actually go through dressing a wound, and we have a couple of videos. I'm going to post a bunch of videos. So now, for those of you that are, there's actually a blind spot in my camera. It's interesting. Um, for those of you that are super duper Cooper excited about this, if you have subscribed to my YouTube channel. I would, if you have not, I would highly suggest it. I would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to my YouTube channel because that means every time I put a video up, you guys get a notification of it. I have all of my videos organized by class. There are already some PTA 208 videos up there. Don't forget to hit that bell as well. You're exactly right, Dara, for new, new notifications. And like all my videos, smash that like button. Um, But on my YouTube channel currently, I actually have already a bunch of PTA 208 videos. Those are from the last class. They've gone through all of this here. So if you wanna go back, and they, their PowerPoint was a little different because I'm revamping my PowerPoints. But if you're one of those people that didn't get this, there's already a video up there for you. There's already some videos about wound care up there. So if it's something that you're interested in, go watch it. There are also, a section on my YouTube channel called PTA 209. PTA 209 is PT seminar. That is where we get you ready for the boards. Those videos are up there if you want to watch it, where I do Q&A with people for the boards. So there's all kinds of stuff up there that's on my YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe, hit that bell, and make sure you smash that like button. Um, actually, it does help me a little bit because it helps me in the analytics to get kind of pushed up with our students. Um, and I, you guys are the only ones that watch, although I did have some weird guy comment on my videos the other day that something about why, why does homeboy look like a cue ball with a, what is it? Why does he look like a cue ball with a broom growing from his chin? That's what he said. Any questions today? Haters are motivators. Exactly right, buddy. 